All right. <sighs> Haven't done it in a while. Yeah. Gotta remember how. Just like riding a bike, except we're not exercising. <laughs> <laughs> so way easier. Welcome back to another episode of Is Fitz Happy? I'm Luke. And I'm Emma. And today we're discussing chapter 11, Forgings. But before we do that... We have a couple of emails and posts and comments sent to us um, about episode 9 that we uh, put out. We're recording this a little bit after it came out, but thank you so much for everything that people have sent to us, uh, answering some of the questions that we had. Yeah. Um, you guys are great, so keep sending us messages. We like hearing them. Um, but, and correct, on, yeah. correct us on all the things that we get wrong. Also that. Um, but thank you to Leah and Joel for finding the um, correct book and chapter of the section I was thinking of about um, the fool's past. Um, and how he came to Buckkeep, yeah, specifically. Yes. Um, they let us know that it is in Assassin's Fate chapter six. six yep near the end of that mm-hmm. um and the fool does say that um he came over uh he or he came to shrewd and had um a note that said that he was a gift from someone unclear who it is it's just a waterlogged note um and s- since he is so private like it's kind of unclear at least in my memory, if he forged it or was actually like given that from mm-hmm. the uh, satrap, because we know he was in Jamalia at some point before that and was held against his will and delayed and it had a huge journey along yeah. the coast up to Buck. So he had, he had quite the time getting there and um, quite a sad journey. Yes. Um, but thank you so much for that. Yes. Thank you guys for that. Also, Thank you, Leah, for letting me know that uh, in Finland, uh, it's flying cows instead of flying pigs is the... uh, Like the idiom? Yeah, I (laughs) guess it's... when pigs fly, it's when cows fly. Yeah, which is really funny and cool to know. Um, And also for letting us know that Fitz is basically just a total Finn. (laughs) So you guys get to claim him. (laughs) Yeah, she had a really interesting email about the um, the culture of the six duchies mm-hmm. and Buck in general compared to Finland and I'm guessing some of the other Nordic countries up there as well. Yeah. Uh, just because we were like, oh, yeah, Verity's just naked and getting dressed in front of Fitz and <laughs> everyone right here. And, you know, nudity isn't yeah. as big of a deal in any of the other countries in the world yeah, as the United States. So. Yeah, definitely didn't think about the fact that america's so weird about nudity in general yeah but Um, uh yeah robin hobb must have uh gathered you know um inspiration from a lot of different places and looks like specifically up in that area um we also got an email from krista to let us know that she's on luke's side and that regal for sure (laughs) for sure could have um given away the six duchy secrets to kill the coastal duchies people without remorse um yeah so i mean mainly because he conspires to kill his own father and you know a bunch of other atrocities right (laughs) yeah and also it is really hard to think that the whites have that much knowledge about you know every little detail because they still lose spoiler alert (laughs) (laughs) oh no not a spoiler here (laughs) um and then uh Thank you to Michelle on Instagram um, for just talking to us about chapter nine. Um, And she pointed out um, something that we didn't bring up, which is that Fitz is kind of acting the way his dad did in the story Burek tells about him in chapter four. Yeah. So when Fitz talks to Lady Grace and feeds her the story of I had a dream and, you know, you... Some lady was giving away her jewels to fund everything, and that became the jewels of the land and everything like mm-hmm. 
he's basically regurgitating the same story that Beric told of about chivalry to Fitz. Mm-hmm. And uh, I just kind of want to quote like a big chunk of it right here because it's literally pretty much word for word the same idea. And I hadn't um, picked up on that yeah. in this reread at all either. So I totally thought of it and then just forgot to say anything about it. So thank you, Michelle, for bringing that up. <laughs> yeah, it's fantastic. So um, this kind of picks up in the middle of the um, of the story here. They're at a some, you know, Duke and some, you know, <laughs> duchy somewhere yeah. eating dinner on some diplomatic trip. Mm-hmm. They'd seated me, Beric, not too far below him, a great honor to me, and I overheard some of his conversation with the daughter they'd seated so hopefully next to the king-in-waiting. She'd asked him what he thought of the emeralds she wore, and he had complimented her on them. I had wondered, sir, if you enjoy jewels, for you wear none of them yourself tonight, she said flirtatiously. And he replied quite seriously that his jewels shone as bright and he replied quite seriously that his jewels shone as brilliantly as hers and much larger. Oh, and where do you keep such gems, for I should dearly love to see them? Well, he replied, he'd be happy to show them to her later that evening, when it was darker. I saw her blush, expecting a tryst of some kind, and later he did invite her out onto the battlements with him. But he took with him half the dinner guests as well, and he pointed out the lights of the coast watchtowers, shining clearly in the dark, and told her that he considered those his best and dearest jewels, and that he spent the coin from her father's taxes to keep them shining so. And then he pointed out to the guests the winking lights of the lord's own watchmen in the fortifications of his keep, and told them that when they looked at their duke, they should see those shining lights as the jewels on his brow. The Out Islanders had very few successful raids that summer. That was how chivalry ruled. Yeah. It's pretty much mirroring the same thing. Like, Out Islander raids are increasing, and something needs to be done. They go there for a diplomatic mission. Probably about the same kind of thing. So, whether (laughs) consciously or subconsciously, he is very much like his father. In um, in Chapter 9, Fitz right before he launches into the story, says he was struck by inspiration Mm -hmm. and kind of just went through it. So uh, I feel like it would be subconsciously because Fitz doesn't like to acknowledge anything like that. (laughs) Any fond feelings of his father. Right. Right. But yeah, that's it's literally pretty much the same exact story. Just gender flipped for the the lady pronouncing that to her kingdom. Yeah. (laughs) We got one last thing here. I want to thank Joel on Facebook for uh, correcting us on episode 10. Last episode, we were talking about Jade's mother, and um, we didn't really know how she met King Bounty, but he uh, mentioned to us that she was a guard. So that's, you know, a lot easier to uh, assume than randomly in the woods. Okay, so um, thank you again, everybody who has messaged us or... Um, let us know something. Yeah, feel free to do so again. We are at isfitshappy at gmail.com or message us on Facebook um, or Instagram or DM us on Twitter, anything like that. We're all at isfitshappy. Yeah, we look forward to hearing from you guys some more. So on to forgings here. We get to start off the chapter with um, the tale of the Pock Man. Yeah, which we were kind of discussing last chapter mm-hmm. because, you know, Chade is steering fear among all of the, the common folk. <laughs> right. Uh, but he was created by, as the legend goes, he was created by El, the sea god, who created a mighty folk by being very harsh to them. But he was so successful in doing so that the people were eventually able to provide for those weaker and they lived on the land and became followers of Ida. Well, he wasn't harsh on them at first though. He was too lax with them because he was so proud. So they didn't have any harsh seas or winds and there weren't hard storms to deter them from getting weak. There were still storms and harsh winters, it says. But it says not enough of them died in the harsh winters. And they, the storms he sent were too mild. Right. 
So I just mean he like wasn't really that harsh on them at first. <laughs> <laughs> he now is super harsh on them, I guess. Which also I didn't remember that L was the first elder. Which yeah, is... that's, that's what he's named as in this story, at least. Mm-hmm. So th- all the the followers of L were dwindling, and um, because all of them followed Ida, and they were prospering on land and everything like that. And there was this one old man who clung to the old ways, but even he was about to drown and die on the sea, basically. His, he was the only one left that was blessing and cursing by L's name. Um, his blessings and curses were weak things that insulted more than pleased L, who had little use for rickety old men. Yeah, so he should have died, um, and the old man cried out for mercy, and L was very mad at him because right. he doesn't grant mercy. So he cursed him, basically, instead, and he rose the pocked man as if barnacles had clung to his face mm-hmm. and warned all the people in the land that, you know, L was going to raise up a new folk to take their land from them, and he brought mm-hmm. diseases with him everywhere. And he also could no longer sail and was supposedly able to live forever. Yep. Um, so it kind of endures that the pocked man as a symbol throughout all of the Six Duchies culture. Yeah. And this is from before the Six Duchies culture. This is from right. the people who were... That's why I'm, I'm kind of curious. There's the specific sentence here that says, and he warned them of their folly, and that El would raise up a new and hardier folk and gem- give their heritage to them. Do you think this is what inspired Taker to come? Mm. This, partially this story of hearing about this distant folk in what was to become the Six Duchies as, you know, land grazers, they don't really sail that mm. much. And Taker believed himself to be a righteous man, a follower of El, and he's like, yeah, I'm going to forsake the the mother homes and everything, but I'm on a, a holy mission to reclaim <laughs> this land for, for El and take their heritage for them. Huh. Um, I hadn't thought of it like that. It just kind of reminded me like of that parallel of... Right somebody who followed those ways we don't know for sure if taker followed l but i could imagine being an out islander he would because most sailors do i believe well my only problem with that is that he then stays and becomes a land dweller himself um i think they call him soil grubbers at one point right which (laughs) just a fun name the specific line itself though um and give their heritage to them it feels like this story is kind of saying yeah the, this new and hardier folk who follows me will come to your land and just take your whole land and your lifestyle you don't mm. deserve it kind yeah. of thing that's an interesting i hadn't really thought about it that way i don't know i just i feel like it would be weird to then never go back to raiding or a, I mean, the sea at all. He could also get be seduced by Ida's <laughs> prosperous ways <laughs> after true. he does that. So I was thinking more along the lines of um, this being one of the first prophets. That'd be interesting, too. Like the pocked man as being yeah, one of the first prophets. Just because we know that they have to they have a compulsion to either write or say their dreams. And I could see how someone could come into a town, they look very different, um, and maybe they were all scarred up because of ill treatment. They live a ridiculously long amount of time, so it would feel like he never died. Um, But then to come to town and tell you about all the bad things that are going to happen to warn you because they felt compelled to share, then you know, obviously they would leave and those things would follow. It, I could see how that would be. Interesting. Maybe maybe it's both. Like, because right. 
I don't think Taker himself is the pocked man. I no. think he was inspired by this story. Right. Well, and the maybe Al- it's the prophecy of Taker coming over to this land. Yeah. Well, I was thinking even maybe a prophecy of the red ship raiders if they succeed. Mm, true. I it just feels like it's vague enough to apply to everything. Yeah. Basically. <laughs> like a pro- like a prophecy. Um yeah, so I guess I just was thinking that maybe that could be the case. Um and also we know that the fool is not a pure white. He he's the closest thing to a pure white right. that the that Clarys has seen in a really long time, but he's not pure. Um because that lineage has died off a long time ago. Mm-hmm. And so that's why, it, like, maybe original whites looked pocked or something. I don't, I don't know why that would be the thing that sticks out. It could still but. be just like an injury or something. Yeah. Too, but. Sure. Um, but I also wanted to ask do you think Ida and Elle are dragons? I'm not sure, honestly. Because Elle likes when people are using his name and so does Ida and he rewards people and he gives them all the fish of the sea and allows them to have you know the the waters are free reign for his people that praise him and I could see a dragon thinking that he's in charge of the whole sea and he won't attack his people that praise him um, because we also know that Out Islanders, which is kind of where this is originating, um, they're sensitive to the um, dragons and, well, the skill, which therefore is their glamour the and everything. Yeah. Like that. Um, and then Ida is just a queen dragon who some people decided to follow instead, and he was mad about it because now they're raising sheep and cattle for her instead of praising him and. Paying attention to him. It just felt very that, yeah. petty like a dragon <laughs> whenever he curses a man to live forever. I think L fits that quite well, but <laughs> the only thing that's making me hesitant in that theory is Ida being like the nurturing. It feels like a, a complete Mother Earth comparison to me because it's like, oh, and she let the weaklings be raised here and everything like that. And it, it didn't seem like the uh, the queen dragon kind of um, attitude because queen dragons are even more vindictive, even more like petty that we see later. Yeah, I guess. I don't know. I just thought that maybe it'd be awesome if they were because yeah. that's a that'd be great. Um, did L the first elder or whatever mm-hmm. kind of trigger yeah. that for you i don't know i just something just their attitudes of like thinking but maybe they do have control over the land and sea but like thinking that they grant the people the ability to live in these areas but like there's no clear indication of whether or not they really truly do anything for these people i mean he says he lets them prosper but that ultimately ends up leading them to go to land. I don't, if you, you if you follow, sorry, I'm kind of jumping back here. It's okay. If you follow that thought, that train of thought that L was a dragon, Mm -hmm. the it's, it says here that, uh, to the folk he gave his sea and with it, all that swam within it and all the lands it touched for their own. For many years, the folk were grateful. They fished the sea, lived on its shores wherever they could, and raided any others who dared to take a boat where El had given them rain. Sounds like elderlings to me. Like, if if he is a dragon... Yeah, yeah. He would make them elderlings, and then that would give credence to um, the pocked man living longer. Yep. He could curse him by changing his changing him makeup, making him look like yep that was my other thought is that the pock man could be some type of hmm. um elderling elderling <laughs> yes the, the pock man could be a, a type of elderling couple a couple interesting theories here yeah nice i don't know i don't know either all of them could be plausible but we will never know yeah 
I just had a thought. I know we were a couple episodes ago. I can't remember exactly which one. We were talking about wanting more books on Queen Desire. Mm-hmm. Um, talking about this intro here, I want a series focused on Taker. And just to see like the reasons and why and, mm-hmm. and what kind of cultures he left and what kind of culture he came to. And then how that morphed together to form the Six Duchies. Interesting. I thought you were going to say a book about the beginning of... Well, that'd be really cool, too. (laughs) Yeah. No, I don't know if I care too much about Taker or his opinions. (laughs) I don't care so much about Taker himself, but I think the reasoning and the culture and the land back then would be incredibly interesting. That's true. And would inform more about that past instead of just getting, like, this was the beginning of the world kind of work hmm. anyway we've rambled on about this beginning because it's super interesting but yes, lots of thoughts yeah lots of thoughts and we kind of get this whole chapter where Fitz goes through a few talks with people there's like four big interactions but the first chunk is basically just a recap and kind of a fast forward through a couple days of him trying to gather information, learn rumors about things Mm -hmm. because we left off where they just had gotten back to neat Bay Mm -hmm. and um, they kind of learned that lady grace's gambit was a success. And the start of this one is that Verity left immediately after they said that they would man their watchtowers like the, Mm-hmm. You know, once he saw that they were doing it, yeah. he was gone. <laughs> Verity, pragmatic to a fault. And that, I think that's the first time that we see Fitz in his narration put some sort of negative connotation to Verity instead of other right. people saying, like, he is not the perfect diplomat. Right. Which I thought was a little interesting as well. Mm-hmm. Well, I think he... After the conversation he had with Verity, where Verity was kind of unwilling to think right. of things other than a black and white issue, it kind of like showed him the more human side of his <laughs> uncle. And now he's like more willing to accept that Verity does indeed have faults. Right, right. Um, but we do see uh, that Lady Time comes back <laughs> with a vengeance and ruins Fitz's journey home. Uh, and I just love that now Fitz knows that it's Shade and so would be 10 times more annoyed by Lady Time oh because my gosh, yes. it's, it's Shade. <laughs> and, oh, that would not be fun. But it's also very funny from Shade's point of view. It says that Fitz devoted himself in the days to come to hear any and all gossip about Lady Time. He heard nothing except that she was reclusive and difficult. How Shade had created her and maintained her fictitious existence, I never completely discovered. Do you have any ideas? Um, not fully, and I think it's a a mystery that I don't really care to know about. Really? Yeah. Oh. I don't know. I like I like that little bit of thing. Do you have an idea? I don't know. I had two trains of thought. Either, um, Shade has like. A spy that is his maid or manservant that works for him that goes in and pretends to cause a ruckus to like subdue her or whatever or because she has to have people come in to bring her food right she can i mean maybe she she travels a lot and so she's just gone i think i think she my idea even though she has quarters in Buckkeep, mm-hmm. I don't know if her quote unquote home is there. Right. Maybe she, maybe Che does want to keep like her home in Buckkeep, but mm-hmm. my thought was maybe since she's reclusive, I have this like distant estate that's mm-hmm. where I live and once in a while I come to Buckkeep and mm-hmm. stay. I figured she just stayed at Buckkeep. 
But my Maybe other school. thought was Jade comes in the middle of the night and just demands <laughs> things once in a while. <laughs> Not in the middle get, of the when night. When he's getting bored. Yes, <laughs> yes, that is exactly my thought. Is that sometimes when he's bored, he dresses up like Lady Time and he just goes and sits with the ladies and <laughs> you know yells at them for stitching wrong or something and just gets a little bit more gossip because the women probably gossip around. We know that they have like sewing circles or embroidery circles. Um, and so I could see him using that disguise to go sit with the women to overhear more gossip that, you know, because a woman complaining about her husband could have vital information he needs to work that husband in a certain way for the king. So I could also see him actually pretending to be Lady Time regularly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jade. Uh, and then we kind of get more gossip about the land, the, the events that Fitz and Shade just kind of went through. Mm-hmm. How Forge, the news of Forge is kind of competing with the news of Lady Grace. Right. And not even Forge can eclipse Lady Grace's speech and triumph and how uh, Lord Kelvar accepted her and said yeah, they will be jewels mm-hmm. and kind of... Um, it was such a big event and momentous. It really shows like Fitz did wonderfully in this diplomatic endeavor, mm-hmm. even though he was kind of blunt and it was <laughs> the first time doing anything like that. It worked out right. beautifully for right. everyone involved. We also know he's like 13 and was 14. So he's, he's 14 pretty at this good. Point, I think. Yeah. He did pretty good for that age. <laughs> I know. I know. Um, it shows a little bit later that people were talking about it a lot and they thought that Prince Verity should find himself a lady right? that had those sentiments and that people were beginning to feel the need of a strong ruler at home because Shrewd's getting old. Mm-hmm. And Burek also says that um, people like to know their king in waiting has a warm bed to come home to, which is a very Burek way of saying that people want to know that there's the possibility of an heir. <laughs> right. And very interesting that he also points out that not very many people get to have romance in their own life, so they want to think about the romance of their king or prince. Um, I thought that was maybe himself projecting (laughs) maybe (laughs) not it could be himself projecting but i think it also is his experience just with the the common folk in general because he's he's in that sort of in-between area Mm -hmm. where he grew up pretty common I'm, i'm sure he saw a lot of neighbors or family just kind of saying oh you know romanticizing these versions of people that they saw far off and then he kind of like rose to that area and he kind of can become a little bit more critical of why they're thinking that way. Right. So I think it might be a little bit of both. Right. And also people like looking ahead. Right. Yeah. Um, and then we talk a little bit more about the Raiders. And how Verity has no time for to think about a bride. Right. Exactly. Um, there are three more towns after Forge. That got, as it came to be known, Raider Forged, uh, Croft, Rockgate, and um, Sheepmire. Yes. So Croft kind of went the same way as Forge. Their people were taken and returned, but unlike the for unlike Forge, they killed anybody who came back. Um. Yeah, the Croft dealt with them themselves, basically. Yep. Uh, The harsh climates of the neat islands bred a harsh people, yet even they had deemed it kindness when they took the sword to their own heartless kin. Mm -hmm. And then Rockgate, they paid the ransom, so -hmm. they had their their people killed, and there's beginning to be, like, little glimmers of, you know, if the king had been more vigilant, if they had warning at least, you know, that would have helped just do something. And then Sheepmire met it squarely and refused to pay and then captured their forged loved ones and tried to rehabilitate them, Mm -hmm. which didn't work. So with 
Rockgate and Sheepmire, we see two different reactions that are polar opposites. I mean, Rockgate, they paid to kill their own people and they didn't ask the king about it. They tell the king, but they don't apologize about it. Um, and they let it be known that it's the king's fault. It's your his fault that if he would have given them more warning, they wouldn't have had to pay this and they there wouldn't have been a raid. And then we she, see Sheepmeyer deciding to take the people back and try to change them back to their old selves. Um, and we get a, you know, a, a terrible description of what the forged people are basically there's there's a a full paragraph here of just right terrible things that they do and how they act and you know it's we, we know that they can't be fixed but they know what they're doing right they can only be fixed by you know certain skill users mm-hmm. or by i think uh, breaking the skill stone or something i don't, I don't remember exactly what happens remember. in tawny man but yeah, it's it's not a chance that they can fix them by just being kind and no. putting them back into the normal situations that they were in. Yeah, but they don't know that, and yep. they're trying, and it gives people hope. Um, but it also, in this passage where we hear about the forged people that they're trying to rehabilitate, um, we see that there are kind of two different types of forged people. There are people who, once forged, are violent and do anything to get whatever they want or, uh, I guess, need at that any given moment. They're not afraid to attack children or family members or strangers. They just will attack. Um, and then the other type are those who do nothing. They w- won't attack you but they have no problem stealing. They have no problem just eating all the food and not spending any time with their family members and not contributing to the amount of food they're eating. And just, I think it's really interesting to see that not everyone is forged the same way. Um, and I wonder if it has something to do with like underlying personality or something. Yeah, I don't um, know. We know that later on they evolve to be, more um group like um but at least in these first instances it seems as though they're very self-centered there is no group they're, mentality. they're always pretty self-centered even right. in, in the groups but yeah they, they're they not cohesively grouping up yet yeah um but yeah so i just thought it was really interesting to see that there are two different kinds of forged people um and the how there are two sides of the same coin. Yeah. And Sheepmire is kind of like a rallying call for a while. People are starting to get hope. Like, yeah, they're trying. Like, this is something we can do. Maybe we can fix this. Mm-hmm. And after a few weeks, like, they, people realize that it's not going to work. And it just slowly peters out. There's, again, no hope. And there's no word. There's no royal edict mm-hmm. from the king. There's nothing to do. There's... There's no specific way that villages should react. So everything is in confusion. Mm-hmm. You know, the, both choices are wrong, but. Right. Yeah. And it says, those who had most supported these efforts now declared that were they taken hostage, they would choose to be hacked to pieces and thrown into the sea rather than return to cause their families such hardship and heartbreak. And so it's really just a turning point of now people are trying to have to think about when I am forged, do this or do that. And they don't have, like you said, the royalty telling them what to do. And Jade kind of in, in a lesson with Fitz is just incredibly frustrated with that response, the lack of response. And he's going on and on about like how this affects the common folk 
because I'm sure he's still thinking of uh, where he, Wolcott, where he grew up. Right. Like right next to Forge and, and the people of Forge that I'm sure he's interacted with before. Mm-hmm. He says, for in deciding our villagers are saying in their minds, not if we are forged, but when we are forged. And thus they have already been raped in spirit, if not in flesh. And he just debates against an invisible shrewd because I'm sure he's had this conversation multiple times imploring him to do something. And he's kind of bouncing all of these thoughts off of Fitz and Fitz is like, well, there, no, no path is a good one. We've seen both of these happen with these villages and none of them have turned out well. And Shade's like, sometimes it's better to be defiantly wrong than silent. It would give the villages some sort of direction. Right. It would unify them. Yeah. And people would be upset either way. Like right. it's. Well, because. I mean, either way, their family members or loved ones could potentially die. It's just which way. (laughs) Yeah. And this is the first time that Fitz has seen Shade criticize Shrewd so forcefully Mm -hmm. or openly. And Fitz just kind of like shrinks in, just hoping Shade will keep talking and doesn't want to interrupt him or anything like that. And I don't know. He he kind of continues on and talks about how he's frustrated in general with Shrewd and how he won't teach Fitz the skill. Well, it's not just his frustration at Shrewd, but also Verity, because Verity isn't doing anything either. It's not just Shrewd. It's the king coming up who right. isn't even stepping up he's not doing anything yeah he says ill omens and warnings and cautions fill you shrewd said to me but i think you want the boy trained in skill simply because you were not it's a bad ambition shade put it from you there speaks the queen's ghost with the king's tongue so the queen is as a side note the queen has died in this yes fitz is still 14 so it must have happened somewhere between when he was 13 and 14. Right. So that's kind of puts like a little time stamp on that. <laughs> um, and then Shade goes on and says, we need chivalry right now. Like, that's who we need. Shrewd hold, holds back and Verity's a good soldier, but he listens to his father too much and Shrewd isn't doing anything. Yeah. And, and Verity's he, not going to take it upon himself. He doesn't have any initiative. Help. Yeah. He does not take the initiative. We need chivalry. He'd go into those towns, talk to the folk who have lost loved ones to forging. Damn, he'd even talk to the forged ones themselves. And Chade's like, no, I agree. It wouldn't solve anything after Fitz disagrees with that. Well, he doesn't disagree. He says, do you think it would do any good? And he says it softly because he's talking about chivalry, but chivalry is dead and he's not coming back. And even though he wants chivalry there, like even anything chivalry could do, would that really help? Would it really be better? Or does it just seem like it's going to be better because you miss him and he was great, (laughs) you know? And honestly, I was surprised because as much as we know, Fitz doesn't really like his dad and is kind of defiant when it comes to good things being said about his dad. I found it very interesting when he asks Uh, during this in the middle of this rampage about how chivalry is amazing and he would have been the best one to do this and to fill this role um he's softly asking would it do any good and it lacks at least to me at least the way i read it it lacked any like malice or defiance because it's his dad they're talking about it just felt like a like stopping someone before they get too far on a rant you know i think he's also just prompting him to speak more i guess yeah because he doesn't want him to stop because Shade doesn't really open up about the inner workings of the politics of the kingdom right too much we've seen this a few times where fitz is just like oh he's he's kind of just like going on and on i don't want to interrupt him in case he just like oh no just pay attention to our lesson and we'll forget it kind of yeah thing. Because he did that with Birik too at some point, I think. Mm-hmm. Chade continues on. He's like, yeah, Verity's just marching his soldiers around. Shrew just watches that happen. 
he's spending all of his energy on Regal. And Fitz, of course, is like, Regal, come on. (laughs) I love this, this line of, always he was at Shrewd's heels, but never had I thought him a real prince. Uh. (laughs) Oh, Fitz. So good. And I guess I get it because Regal is not very princely in the way that Verity is. And he's super petty and rude and only cares about his looks. And, um, but I mean, honestly, he's kind of more textbook prince like yeah. than Verity. But I could see how someone raised by Burek <laughs> would see Verity as more prince like just because he seems to have more virtues right yeah exactly (laughs) and um it says that shrewd is spoiling him since his mother died trying to buy his allegiance and regal is taking full advantage and just saying what shrewd wants to hear and things like that Uh, and i was discussing with you earlier emma that i don't know why he's trying to do this so desperately and ignoring everything um, because Shrewd is incredibly smart, and I'm sure he knows that he should make a decision about something if he was in his right faculties. But I don't know if he is at this point. Right. Because why is he spending so much time on Regal when there's such a crisis happening in his kingdom? Right. Well, because you asked me this earlier off the pod, I had time to think about it. Um... And so I have a little bit of an answer, I think. Um, We know that Shrewd married... um, Desire. Desire, thank you. (laughs) Married Desire out of love. He loved her. She probably didn't, but he did love her. She saw more power. Right. And I have to believe that even though she was a trash person to him and he recognized that she just liked him for power, he still loved her. And so when she died, all he had left of her is her son. Right. And so I could see how you would then take the son that maybe he had taken for granted, which even there, I don't think he did because I feel like Regal was always at his heels and he was always around. And I don't know if that was because Regal wanted to be seen near his father to give the impression that he was the favorite or what was going on with that. But it does feel like Shrewd was working overtime before Desire's death to kind of teach Regal how to be his son and what it meant to be part of his family and didn't really succeed. But now that his mother is dead, he's trying to keep her memory alive because Regal is so much like his mother. Yeah. And so to me, it just is. He lost someone he loved and now he's trying to hang on to the little bit of her. He has left grieving in his own way and just not paying attention to anything. Yes. Which isn't great. No, but also humans. Yeah. Sometimes can't help when grief hits, you know, or how they respond to it. So I do want to ask you about Verity. Um, so Shade is criticizing Verity and talking about how he is just hemming and hawing and not really making any decisions. He's just weighing the like each option without picking one. Why? Isn't Verity treating this like he's a general? There's a war going on and he's not being a leader to his troops. Like, why isn't that the image that he's taking? Why doesn't he think at least if I made a decision one way or the other, that's an order I'm giving my troops and they're going to follow it and that'll make things better. Why is it? I think he is. He is treating it like that, but he was never the commander. He could have led his troops with orders, Mm -hmm. but like Shade says in here that he he doesn't take the initiative to do it himself. He has to be told what to do, and then he would make sure that's followed out and carried through. I think he's treating it like a war and moving his soldiers around to try to react to the raids themselves. Mm -hmm. But that general decision is not his to make in his mind. That is the king's still. So he's just waiting 
to be asked and shrewd isn't waiting to be told not even asked <laughs> that's fair. i think because he was raised as the second right so he would have probably become the leader of the army as the prince mm-hmm. and chivalry would have been king but chivalry would still tell verity what to do in those decisions and True. verity would carry it out and i think that's how he's been trained his whole life so he's never had to figure out that taking an initiative and taking that first step is very important. That's fair. I guess I'm asking this as an older sibling, where if I see something that needs to be done, I just do it, whether or not I'm given permission to be in charge. And I do have a younger sister that literally you have to, she, you have to tell her that it's her time to be in charge. And even then you have to tell her it's okay to make a decision. So I guess I wasn't thinking about it like that, but I do No, that there are people that don't naturally just see a problem and just fill that need. You have to learn to be proactive. You can't just decide one day. I mean, you can, but you have to think about it hard. And I think Verity, you know, I'm just speculating now, but I think Verity wants to fix everything. But the royal family is so structured in what commands come from where and how the kingdom perceives those commands Mm -hmm. that if he acted and rumor gets out that shrewd is still kind of doesn't know what decision to do it could look like verity is trying to um either take the kingdom out from under him or that he thinks his own father is weak okay like they have to present that united front interesting okay see i guess i just thought because in the beginning we hear Burek saying that people like to look forward and think about the next king. And there's so much criticism on Verity himself that I just assumed that if he just made a decision, <laughs> maybe it, it would it, fix it. But it would you're probably right. work out for the better. But at the same time, like there's that risk. Like, right. I, I don't know. You're right. I didn't think about those implications. But so uh, the lesson with Shade ends violently with the canister of whatever they were heating exploding. And. and- we learn that that's how he got his that's, scars. That's how we learn Shade got his scars from uh, an experiment and not from barnacles in the sea or <laughs> <laughs> like the pocked man. Right. Um, and he hasn't called for another lesson for a few weeks and Fitz is daydreaming and kind of sends his wit up towards Shade. Well, he's, he's not daydreaming. He just says he's daydreaming. <laughs> He's daydreaming in the sense that he's doing a task and thinking about Shade and wondering why he's not doing anything. So he's not as focused. And he sends his life sense up towards Shade to try to find him or anything. Doesn't work because he's, you know, in the stables. (laughs) And Beric smacks him across the head. Right. Well, he does find secrecy and discordance, but not like anything. But anyway. Yes, Bjerk smacks him in the back of the head. But I wanted to ask, I saw this as more of a skill thing that he was doing. Reaching out and feeling for, I mean, that is definitely the wit. The wit is like reaching out and feeling life force. But I mean, everything that we learn later is um, when he skills, it has the taint of wit intertwined with it. Right. So he probably just does both instinctively now. That's that's what I was going to ask. Is Do you think that the reason that Burek knows is because it has the wit with it? Probably, yeah. I would guess so. He doesn't know how to close himself with the skill yet. And he's just learning how to extend himself with the wit. And I, I feel like there's a, a passage somewhere that says that he doesn't just use the wit to extend like the yeah. life sense around. He kind of pushes it forward with the skill mm-hmm. and like yeah. uses them to leverage the other. So. That's exactly what I was thinking about when reading this. Just because when he does feel out for shade and feels, um, I guess secrecy and discordance are kind of an emotion. Yeah, but not, hey, it's more. I don't know. It's more of a state. So I agree with you that it's kind of yeah, both. It felt like a very weird mix of both, just based on what we know in the future of how skill works and wit. Um, but then I was like, oh my gosh, Beric felt it though. And then I was also maybe he is sensitive to the wit, but he wouldn't be because he's closed off completely from it because of the skill. You mean the skill? Yes. Sorry. 
Correct. Yeah. Burek is sensitive to the skill, but he wouldn't be at all because it's all closed off. And I don't even know if he was sensitive to the skill before he was closed off. He was just that well of strength. Um, just like Perseverance in the last trilogy, he's also like a well of strength that he can draw upon, but he's not affected by any of like the skilling from Vindelier or anything like that. Well, neither is Shine, but she has that block on her. So that's right. why I feel like maybe he was at some point and he just can't be influenced by it maybe. now because maybe it could be either way. Like, I think there are two kinds of people like that. People right. that are naturally born to be the, just the wells of strength that are, have their own natural walls around them where they can't extend their skill sense, but they can be drawn upon mm -hmm. and people who are unnaturally blocked like yeah. shine. Well, we and know that later Burek. Yeah. Burek is blocked and that's why I'm not sure. Right. Which one he is. So um, Beric smacks him and says, don't sully chivalry's blood. Don't do that around me. And Fitz inwardly seethes. We kind of right. see like a, a growing anger and resentment towards the disdain that Beric feels for that. And mm -hmm. Fitz feels is just natural. Right. Which is so interesting to me that Fitz continues to not think that the wit is a bad thing. He never loses a sense of this is just something natural and I should hide it from people, but that doesn't mean that I'm going to stop using it or feel bad about using it. Really? I'm just going to feel bad about lying about using it. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know. It just seems like a weird thing because Fitz does seem very influenced by um, those around him. And so it's weird that this is one thing where he's adamantly not going to take Burek's word for it. Right. Then it kind of transitions into walks with Molly. Um, it says another two towns were forged that summer. So that brings our total up to six. Forge, three others after, and then these two. And uh, of course, everyone's kind of scared. Stories are abound. Right. Um, and they're discussing it. Molly and Fitz are discussing it. Mm -hmm. um, and it also mentions that Beric had been called away. So Fitz could, you know, take his evenings more leisurely and go down to town. And that mm -hmm. Cobb was gone visiting um, with Regal to Turlake to tend his horses and hawks. Because I believe it mentioned before that Cobb kind of became the hand for Regal. Right. The... The horse and hound boy for him. Basically what Burek is. Yep. But for Regal. Um, but I thought it was really cute that when we're talking about Molly um, and the walks with Molly, um, he says, sometimes our elbows bumped as we walked. So cute. Like, ooh, <laughs> we touched elbows, which is such a, you know, that's a, that's a good <laughs> capture of what it feels like to be like this whole section with Molly is such mm -hmm. a good. Oh, the writing is just so good. It it's just a little slice of life right into like a high school uh, romance, a middle school, just tween romance where you're not really sure what this whole romance thing is, but you're feeling feelings and it's fun. I don't know. It's just very cute and very oblivious fits moments, which is on brand so <laughs> um, it does happen a couple times in here like, where they have those little like moments and stuff too mm -hmm. uh it does mention that her father's health is still failing right um he's incredibly weak he doesn't really need much of a drink to even fall asleep easy at night um so that's kind of on the downward spiral there right. um but when they meet up molly packs food um, which we know, well, I guess we don't necessarily know how she's doing at this point financially. Um, but I feel like her always having food on her would be a little bit of a, like, financial burden to her just because, I mean, she doesn't have Cook making her all the food, you right. know? I think um, she's doing pretty well for herself from what she mentions, though. Like, right. Um, the last chapter that we had with her, she's talked about how she made the best certain kind of candles. Mm -hmm. And 
I don't know. I, I feel like she's doing a really good job with the business at the moment. Right. Well, I don't think she's doing bad. I just know that it had been hard before. So also, why isn't Fitz bringing the food? He literally he has the, the kitchen. Wine. Okay, well. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but she is talking, Molly is talking about um, some of the rumors around town and about how um, the forged people supposedly are grouping together to become bandits on the road well they're someone's scared about that happening during winter right Mm -hmm. and Fitz almost outs himself mm -hmm. says oh that wouldn't happen they don't have any kinship enough kinship in them and it says he contradicted her lazily and it's just ugh. i this line kind of made me bristle a little bit um just the the way he dismisses her is just a little bit rude and Burek taught him better than that. <laughs> Even if it's something that he does know more about than her because of personal experience, he could still say it respectfully. Um, but it does. I do love that now he's surprised after contradicting her lazily and just kind of nonchalantly saying, no, you're wrong. Um, He's like, but now I heard an edge of annoyance in her speech as though she wouldn't be annoyed to be told that she's wrong by somebody who she believes has no firsthand knowledge of this. Well, I like I read it kind of similar, but also like I have a completely different take on this Okay, because she was saying rumors of people she knew of what right. they thought might happen. And Fitz is like, I, I doubt it. I mean, it's most likely it's other people passing themselves off as forged ones and robbing because the forged ones definitely don't have any kinship to band together. Right. And I didn't like the contradicted her lazily. The lazily part was like because it, it right after it ex- kind of explains that he was just walking along, looking at the scenery, mm-hmm. just enjoying their time to the other kind of thing. And. I, I didn't think it would be like a. Uh, a condescending like oh no i know about this kind of thing it was just like oh i i doubt that like they don't have any reason to be afraid like it's probably just normal people robbing i can see how that would be your take i guess i just read it differently because that's my personal experience yeah sure i, I mean yeah that- <laughs> not just like i don't know i feel like girls in general usually get condescended to by boys and especially i mean we know that he actually knows what he's talking about but molly doesn't right yeah and so looking at it from her point of view is, yeah is, it yeah. would be pretty rude and also like okay well you don't know any more than i do like and his excuse of like well that's what i heard from the soldiers is like okay so you're basing it off your rumors versus my rumors so how you know i don't know I just felt sorry for Molly in this instance, just because whether it's meant to be condescending or not, it's never fun to have somebody just shoot down whatever it is you're saying. (laughs) Um, I do want to point out again, it says to her, I was an errand boy for the keep working for the stable master when I wasn't fetching for the scribe. So again, he still hasn't told her anything about who he really is, what he's doing. And then um, when he says his uh, excuse, I've heard the talk of the guards when they're around the stable and kitchens at night. Um, and she says, perhaps she seemed mollified by my comments. I thought that was I, I was wondering if Robin Hobb kind of laughed to herself as she wrote. Mm-hmm. Molly seemed mollified. <laughs> <laughs> I thought of it as one of those like, all right, I'm not going to fight with you about this. So perhaps. And this conversation is done. We're just going to go to a different topic because I don't want to get mad about this. And so I thought it was kind of funny. Just the little sh- like I, don't, I could see how young Fitz would be like, oh, that was a good enough thing. Whereas Molly could potentially be thinking this dumb boy using his rumors versus mine. I'm changing the subject, <laughs> you know, moody teenage girl stuff. She changes the subject again to climb up onto something to get to a picnic area. Mm -hmm. 
and um, Fitz says that he's kind of preoccupied then of watching her, how she would manage her skirts, and taking opportunities to catch at her arm to balance her or take her hand to help her up a, a steep bit. Um, and in a flash of insight, I knew that Molly's suggestion that we climb had been her way of manipulating the situation to cause this. <laughs> Another cute little teenage thing. Like, uh-huh. oh, create situations where we have to hold hands. Right. And you have to pay attention to mm-hmm. me. <laughs> I totally remember being that way at this age. Like, on the bandstands during marching band. Oh, my hands are so cold from holding my flute. Please warm them up, cute boy. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it's before I knew you, it's fine. <laughs> but, yeah, so this was very cute. Very, um reminiscent of childhood crush they get to talking during their food here about the rain maiden which is a ship and molly is like it's been on patrol i mean it's we put together a bunch of offerings like all the merchants and people that could donate to patrol for the raiders basically and fitz hadn't heard that right And I do want to point out that she says almost every merchant in town contributed. That's a lot of people. I mean, even she, in her own little small way, contributes. Yeah. Um, But that's a lot of people for Fitz to not have heard this at all yet. She's manned with fighters now and escorts the ships between here and High Downs. The green spray meets them there and takes them farther up the coast. I hadn't heard heard that, and it surprised me that I had not heard such a thing up in the keep itself. My heart sank in me that even Buckheap Town was taking measures independent of the king's advice or consent. I said as much. And I, I kind of want to bring this back to the previous discussion about what Molly was saying about like the rumors. Mm-hmm. Um, Fitz right now is doing the same thing that Shade does with Lady Time. He has created a persona, mm-hmm. new boy, who is not as drastic as Lady Time from Shade, <laughs> but is someone completely different who does a different thing and talks to the common folk to understand the rumors and how they feel and get knowledge. Just like lady time was going to go knitting and neat bay and learn from those people. Right. So he learns that, um, Sarah, the butcher's daughter, that she positively yearns for winter and that the red ships will be beaten back and the raids will be delayed and they Mm -hmm. can't sail during winter. But also that Kelty, um, thinks that the the raiding will stop but the forged ones will band together and rob people right and now he learns that there are patrol ships that the merchants have done and contributed to themselves in buckkeep town and he's learned all these new things and it, it just reminded me so much of the way chade gathers information he's kind of learning it firsthand that yeah. lesson even though chade told him already mm-hmm. like he's he's straight up just like it's getting hammered in as opposed to just like the high table gossiping with that mm-hmm. his table partner about how um, the linen wouldn't come in and because there were raiders, highwaymen on there and the guards weren't patrolling. Right. Yeah, no, that's a good comparison. Um. And so they, they get to talking about how the king isn't doing anything, basically. And right. Molly says... Well, Molly's angry yeah, that the king yeah, isn't doing anything. Yeah. and. Fitz doesn't quite understand why, because while he understands that it's frightening that this is happening, she's safe. You're in Buckkeep. Like, yeah. you're, you're going to be safe here. And that's when Molly hits him with, um, I had a cousin apprenticed out in Forgetown. She paused. Then she said carefully, will you think me cold when I say that we were relieved to hear that he had only been killed? Yeah, that's... It's a rough situation, and like that kind of expresses the sentiment of the people, right. like that they would rather their family members die rather than be alive, like the forged ones, right? And they have to deal with that guilt. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That if somewhere where your family members gets attacked, you're hoping that they die, and that would be horrible to deal with. And on top of that, your king, who makes laws and demands taxes isn't doing anything that you can see to help. And so she's rightfully angry and it's just really, 
interesting to have Fitz then have to deal with this and come to terms with, wow, maybe the king isn't always right or isn't always doing what's best. Yeah, and he he kind of tr- he says I'm sorry and tries to answer with um maybe the king himself doesn't really know what the best option is cuz he heard that and discussed that with Jade. Mhm. And she's like, "Well, he's the king. He's named shrewd to be shrewd," which kind of again shows <laughs> the the belief that the royal names are magically bound to those characteristics. Right. Like he, he has to know what's going on. People think he's just being miserly and hoarding all of his gold. So the merchants pay for the mercenaries instead of him. And the, the attitudes of the town folk are just really, really just sinking. Right. Like the, it just that the attitudes toward the Royal family is just like, ugh, the confidence in them just going down. And Molly is just getting angrier and angrier. And I'm sure she and her fellow merchants and everything that sparked this patrol ship talk kind of is that those conversations have been played out. And I think she uses these trips with Fitz to kind of escape from that. So she changes the conversation like we don't want to talk about politics on these. Mm -hmm. Let's just talk about nice things. And then she talks about the dogs, which, of course, as it would with Burek, gets Fitz's mind right off yep. <laughs> yeah. of anything that they were talking about before. <laughs> talks about, uh, you know, gathering blackberry preserves for winter and, you know, things to make her candles with and scent them with. And then they head home and there's a nice little tension between them that Fitz can feel yeah. with his wit sense. And she seems to react to it, too. Mm-hmm. Um, and he wants to ask her if she feels it, but he's too scared that she'll react the way Burek does. And the way that Jade kind of did. Right. As well. Even though he didn't straight up say to Jade that he was witted, Jade right. kind of, you know, figured it out. Yeah. But do you think she is a little bit witted? I don't think so. I think she's witted in the same sense that all of us have kind of that that instinctive feel of like oh things are there's something here right like just just that natural inclination to react to things Fitz is the only one who can actually sense that he has that new sense and that's like kind of the difference Hmm. I was thinking of it like how there are different degrees of people's skill ability same and how with some people witted. Would... Ketrikin is slightly witted as well, right. but she can't talk to Night Eyes or anything, even though he talks to her constantly. Mm. But she reacts sometimes, almost like she could understand. Right. I think Molly is not quite to Ketrikin's degree of witted. Right. Maybe it's just like an intuition thing. Yeah. Like you're saying, just the natural, like, mm-hmm. you can feel tension in the air when there's she, tension. She might be more open to it than... Than most people maybe that's why like maybe it's kind of passed down that's why her family is so good at candle making hmm. even though like you can't really bond to like a group of bees maybe you're just more open to the feeling of like what they need in that moment right how to be calm around animals that sort of thing yeah interesting but i yeah i don't know because like all of her kids are witted right no not no. all of them just <laughs> no. a good chunk <laughs> but yeah so Okay, but then oh, my little facepalm moment. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were going to talk about this. <laughs> they get to her door. Uh huh. She paused a moment as if thinking of something else she wanted to say, but then gave me only a quizzical look and a softly muttered, good night, new boy. Yeah, he, he walked her to the door and said, goodbye. And she paused. And she's like, are you going to kiss me? Or, <laughs> and he's just like, la, 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 la. Wow, he's what 14, a she's 16. <laughs> Come on. Ugh, still, just, ugh, every time I read that, I, I just, like, am so embarrassed for him. And it seems like even older Fitz 
telling this doesn't quite get that she was trying to get him to kiss her i uh, see i think he does but he doesn't want to point it out because he's embarrassed and he's <laughs> <laughs> he's just kind of like ranting on the page he's like um yeah just like she had a weird question she didn't ask i don't know definitely not because she wanted me to kiss her for sure because <laughs> you don't want to look back in the past and be like like okay as a guy i am very this is generalizing <laughs> but generally i found it to be true <laughs> we don't catch signs very easily about what other people want specifically in romantic relationships and interests we're more likely to respond positively if you just tell us <laughs> so you don't want to look back you know 10 years later and be like oh my god she wanted me to kiss her <laughs> You don't you don't want that in your life. That bad energy right there. That's fair, but I think it is funny that even Fitz who can literally read people is like, hmm, she just looked at me quizzically and then maybe she's just being nice to me. I don't know. <laughs> oh, it it was just very cute. Very cute the little oh, Fitz. <laughs> oh yeah. <sighs> little innocent boy <laughs> and then he uh comes back to the stables after that nice night and sees new horse two new horses nice horses yeah one of them at least is extremely nice horse mm -hmm. must and be he, noble <laughs> he admired the quality of her horses at that point yep and he went to the kitchens because he was hungry how does he know it's a noble woman just based um, off the horse? Do noble women only ride a certain type of horse? And one lady's palfrey, so they must keep, like, a specific kind. Um, that has to be a breed of horse, right? Palfrey. I don't know. I should look it up real quick. Palfrey, a docile horse used for ordinary riding, especially by women. So, probably just, it wasn't a stallion for, like, a soldier. And a stallion is like a war horse. Right. And that's probably what lords would want to ride as well, because they want to be seen as, you know. I guess, yeah. <laughs> you have a point. But yeah, okay. So it's a sexist reason. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know. But he was correct in his yeah. assumption. In the, um, and in the time period so, that this is. Yeah. I'm sure. So he goes to uh, the kitchens to find something else to eat. Because they just had like little sausages and cheeses and stuff on their picnic and uh, a meal. And he's a 14 year old boy and needs to eat more. He's growing like crazy. Mistress Hasty is super mad because yep. she can't keep clothes on him. <laughs> I should have to wrap. She declared I should have to wrap myself in bark cloth like a wild man if I keep <laughs> growing. And there's another reference to the wild men. Yes. It's like the second reference. And then beyond this, I don't remember anything else about that. So they have yellow and black painted teeth. Uh, tarred tar hair yeah tarred hair yeah and or red red and black teeth red and black thank yeah. you and red then they wrap themselves in bark cloth which i assume is made from tree bark yeah probably like hammered tree bark and what woven. are these people and i and they come into town to buck keep yeah. the trade like and it's just i mean I no wonder being town people think that they're all a bunch of hillbillies <laughs> true <laughs> we have to respect other people's cultures we do but it, tarring hair like doesn't seem fun well not wearing clothes doesn't seem fun in a place where there's regular winters and storms well they have bark cloth okay but <laughs> they, prob they probably have furs <laughs> i would hope i guess it just says bark cloth so i don't know oh, yeah. i just want them to be safe and not die of hypothermia <laughs> But Fitz walks in, and second time in two chapters, he is in the kitchens with a noble woman who he doesn't expect to see in the kitchens. Mm -hmm. um, but this time, the noble woman, <laughs> you can tell, is a noble woman, yes. even though she seems to be trying to keep that on the down low. Yep. But at the sight of me coming in the door, she sprang up and put her hand over her heart as if she thought I were the pocked man himself. Or she might have thought that you were the ghost of her late husband. Right. Just like her brother <laughs> did. <laughs> or his brother, excuse me. I wonder... Lady Patience, by the way, has, yes. has made her entrance. <laughs> if those of you who have uh, read it a long time ago don't remember, this is the introduction to 
patience. Um, do you think it's just been, well, how long ago did his dad die? This is, it's only been a, a year. He's 14 right now. And his dad died when he was like 12. Something like that. Yeah. So it's been two years. So does that mean people just stop talking about how much he looks like his dad? Because why wouldn't your immediate thought of... No, he a, was just told that again in Nipe, remember? Right. When he got dressed up. So why wouldn't his immediate thought... I mean, it is fits we're talking about, so common sense doesn't seem to be True. a natural thing for him. But if everybody always thinks you look like your dad, why wouldn't you just assume this person knew your dad? Even if he couldn't guess who it was, like... It doesn't, Why wouldn't you think? I don't know. It doesn't seem like he has much interaction with a lot of the nobles. It seems like he does his lessons with Beric, who mm-hmm. has known him forever. Right. Does his lessons with Hod. Does his lessons with um, the scribe Fen- Fedrin and learns whatever else. And with Chade. And those people are used to him. They've been around him for a while. And he's only commented on like, Oh wow, you look like chivalry when he got dressed up for Nipe. Mm. Um, that night when chivalry or when chivalry died and Verity and Regal were coming down the road, just thinking of chivalry. Right. So with lady patience, I'm sure chivalry is literally in her mind at all times at this point still. Yeah. Like she's, she's just visiting Buckheap for the first time since his death. Mm-hmm. Like this is the first night that she got there. And that's where he was from. Like, I'm yeah. sure is just like in the forefront of her mind while she was down in the kitchens eating. Yeah. And then pops through the door. And I'm sure and she's thinking about Fitz because she probably came to see him. Right. Like, that's yeah. why she's in town to get to know Fitz. <laughs> right. So she is extremely startled and Fitz is fairly polite at the beginning like he's he's like i didn't mean to startle you do you want me to get you anything like please i'll you know i'll get out of your way if need be he gathers his food and and she sits back down and um he notices that she's a noble woman for sure Mm -hmm. and she is modulating her voice probably trying to keep it steady at this point and just like you know i'm this isn't chivalry. Mm-hmm. This is the person I came here to see. I don't want him to know that. Or she doesn't <laughs> even realize that. She's just like, yeah. I'll just talk to him, you know? <laughs> I don't <laughs> well, need to I'm introduce sure she... myself. <laughs> right. It is it is patience. So <laughs> maybe she wanted to see what he's like before he knows who she is. Because True. I'm sure she knows. She's an adult. She knows that this child who knows that his dad ab- abandoned him probably because of her from rumors Mm -hmm. she would know that telling him would change how he treated her so this is just a chance to get to see if he's really like her dead husband yeah or like naturally or if he's gonna try to pretend to be like him you know just i could see here but also it says that her voice is almost musical and i'm just thinking of amy adams in enchanted um (laughs) (laughs) And that's just like how I expect she talked with her hands, like at the weird princess hands. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he starts to gather um, some items, you know, some cheese, some ale, and he can feel her staring at him mm-hmm. the whole time. And he's like, can I get you anything? Any <laughs> ale? And she's, she's like, like, yes, please. Thank you. Do you think she just says yes? Because she wants to keep him there and keep yeah. talking and yeah it needs so. an excuse of why she's yep uh-huh yep. the ale that's uh-huh he's wondering if he smelled bad because she's like <laughs> so focused on him and he's like oh molly would have told me she's pretty upfront about that stuff which is, which is amazing that molly is like <laughs> yeah you smell you like smell. manure yeah <laughs> like you stables smell so bad <laughs> i love that for her that she is not afraid to tell this cute boy which also he's like 14 he has to be like pimply and awkward especially like he's going through growth spurts he's like gotta be just going through puberty yeah i want to believe that he's all pimply and awkward but also (laughs) he's royalty and this is a magic book so he probably is beautiful (laughs) he he doesn't get an awkward phase clear pores Mm -hmm. (laughs) uh and he's kind of trying to balance all of his meal and starts to head out and she's like sit down halfway in between an invitation and a command 
Uh. <laughs> it's not right. I should scare you away from your meal. And he just starts like shoveling food and she's staring at him openly. Uh. Not like a rude gaze or anything, but just like. Just watching him. Just staring. <laughs> and he says he's eating quickly as fruitively as a, as a rat in a corner who suspects a cat is behind the door waiting. And I just like. He's getting it. just more and more nervous. He's uh-huh. like, who is this woman and why is she staring at me the whole time I'm eating? And he's getting ale. Like, I just want to go home. It's so funny. He's fumbling with his food and his drink and he spills. He's like choking on his ale. <laughs> <And> like, <laughs> she's like lifting her eye, like eyebrow and like, hmm. Trying not to. You can tell she's just trying not to laugh whenever he's spilling all over himself and choking. Um. <laughs> he's being extra clumsy and i'm sure well maybe if she's trying not to cry i don't know hard to tell but i would like to think that um she's trying not to <laughs> try not to laugh yeah um, and he kind of rushes out the door and gets home and right well he rushes but then he remembers that burek told him how oh, to exit yes, when yeah. a lady is present so he has to turn around and swallow his half-eaten food um and he says, good night to you, lady, I muttered, thinking the words not quite right, but I, unable to summon better. I crabbed towards the door. Wait, she said. When I paused, she asked, do you sleep upstairs or out in the stables? Both. Sometimes. I mean, either? Uh, good night then, lady. I turned <laughs> and all but fled. <laughs> And he realizes he kept his mug, his empty mug. Uh (laughs) He's just so overwhelmed by awkwardness. He's (laughs) such an awkward person and it's beautiful. I love it. Which, to be fair, it's a beautiful lady. I mean, even I'm sure it's not like a crush thing, but like a beautiful lady is paying attention to you. Right. And it's a noble woman who he doesn't know. And he's been told all of his life that. You shouldn't be interesting to people. Right. Because you need to keep your head down. Mm -hmm. And she is just openly staring and like asking questions. And I don't know. It's. Yeah. He probably hasn't had attention like that from anyone besides Chade or Beric. Right. And even they don't really. No. Focus on him like that. No. They. (laughs) Um. But. I think it's interesting that she asks about where he sleeps. Why do you think he, she does that? She wants to know how he's being treated. Um, I know next chapter, we talk, we talk about her again. Mm-hmm. He, he meets her again a couple times, and she's asking him, like, do you sing? Do you play an instrument? Do you know the ballads and stuff like that? I think meeting him and seeing him walk into the kitchen and do this stuff and maybe faintly smelling like the stables and hearing that Beric is taking care of him. Mm -hmm. She's like, Beric, that scoundrel is going to, he's make, he's taught my little Fitz how to drink when he's 14. (laughs) He's like gulping his drink down. Uh Does he sleep in the stables? Like, is he being treated as a prince should? I think she's just like concerned and wants to know that chivalry's son is being taken care of how he should be taken care of Hmm. i like that take um so as we said he gets to bed super awkward um and he said he finishes the chapter off with i went to sleep feeling a fool and wondering why i think he's pretty happy this chapter yeah i think so too he's worried for the future and for some things and he's concerned about the king's inaction. Not as much as Chade, but I think Chade has kind of instilled that that slight worry into him. Right. Well, like, Shade's worried about it. Yeah. We something needs to be done. But overall, like it's a pretty pleasant summer yeah. for Fitz, and it's kind of like the the fully last happy moments. Of like an extended period of time for him for yeah. the foreseeable future. I think that this is kind of the last time where the forged people don't really touch him. It doesn't right. pertain to him like he knows about it and he's 
worried about the future but it isn't something that directly affects him and in a child's way of if it's not immediately a threat to me then it doesn't matter he is able to be content in what is going on around him we're closing on the end of summer here and i think in the fall i think he starts learning the skill because patience is like he needs to be a prince basically mm, i don't remember it might be in winter and then he pretty soon around there he starts killing the forged ones right like he's, so then he's it is sent real. out so this is kind of the last of his childhood yeah 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 i mean he's he's very competent obviously because Beric right. is comfortable in leaving and letting all the chores to fits but yeah this is his last like carefree yeah. like i can spend my nights how i like to right and i mean <laughs> 14 isn't necessarily a child, but it's not quite a adolescent either. Right. It's yeah. that awkward. It's that awkward age. It's really just, I think, an area where you are learning a lot and developing into the type of adult you're going to be. Right. Yeah. A lot of things happen in this chapter. A lot of things to discuss. Um, please. Let us know anything that you have to add to the conversation. We'd love to hear more thoughts on theories about Ida and L or the Pocked Man or mm-hmm. what you think about any of that introduction. Um, what you think about uh, Regal's rise to his father's favorite. Yeah. Yeah. What, what Trude is kind of thinking there. Verity's inaction. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> his ineptitude. Or just the chat. <laughs> or just the chat, yeah. We'll try to respond to everyone. Um, sometimes we take a couple days, or maybe it's just a few minutes, depending on what we're doing at the time. <laughs> right. If we happen to be checking that at the moment. Yeah. Thanks so much for listening today. I hope to hear from you soon. Please visit us at isfitshappy.com or any of our socials at isfitshappy. And you can email us at isfitshappy at gmail.com. And we look forward to hearing from you guys soon.